and welcome back to Love Gianna. Today we have back the brilliant Dr. Joel Furman. Thank you so much for being with us again. My pleasure. All right, let's get right into the questions. What are the main four principles of a nutritarian diet? Well, you know, the nutritarian diet is designed to be like the gold standard of nutritional excellence to maximize human lifespan and slow aging. And the foundational principle, which is represented by the equation H equals N over C, talks about having a good micronutrient bang per each caloric buck, that you're getting a good micronutrient excellence or adequacy per calories you're consuming, picking foods that have a lot of antioxidants and phytochemicals and vitamins and minerals, particularly green vegetables, with that acronym GBOMS, which identifies those foods that have the strongest anti-cancer effects in the scientific literature, standing for greens, beans, onions, mushrooms, berries, and seeds. We're trying to go after not just um, nutritional quantity, but also nutritional diversity. So a wide variety of food types in the diet, um, expanding not even only those foods, but we're focusing on those foods to make sure we highlight them to include them in your daily menus. Um, so, what the, so the first principle has to do with nutritional density and nutritional adequacy, micronutrient adequacy. The second principle, of course, has to do with trying to achieve hormonal favorability, the right level of hormones. And that's referring predominantly to the glycemic effect of your diet. If your diet has like honey and um, white flour, white rice, you know, things that are where the blood sugar raises in response to eating that food, you could have a higher circulating level of insulin. And being overweight makes your diet more hormonally unfavorable because you become more insulin resistant with more fat on the body. And then, so that's one thing that's very unfavorable to a person's longevity is eating high glycemic carbohydrates. And the second thing is animal protein in particular, animal products, which hormonally drive cellular replication. The extra protein, the completeness of the amino acids drive IGF-1 or insulin-like growth factor one, which also is a growth promoting hormone. Those two hormones, insulin and IGF-1, if they rise simultaneously, like they do in most Americans who are eating like you know, macaroni and cheese and hamburgers and pizza, and they're eating, you know, white flour and animal products. The combination of those two hormones raising is most dangerous for promotion of cancer. And of course, um, cell proliferation and premature death, increasing the aging process. So we're trying to keep animal products either very low or, or eliminated. And of course, to keep um, high glycemic carbohydrates. Our most favored carbohydrate are beans and peas and lentils because they're so high in resistant starch, they're high in protein, and they have slowly digestible carbohydrates, which keep your, which don't require much insulin because their, their body is absorbing the carbohydrates at such a slow pace. And you don't need much insulin when it's coming in so slowly. And they're also very rich in protein. So we, we try to reduce the, you know, the higher glycemic carbohydrates and stick to more peas and beans and fruits and root vegetables. In any case, the third principle has to do with making sure nothing's missing in your diet. We call it comprehensive nutritional adequacy. In other words, you could have the healthiest diet eating all the kale and strawberries in the world, but if you're deficient in B12, vitamin D, zinc, K2, DHA, there's the one, your one weakness, your one thing that's gonna be your downfall was that one aspect where you were nutritionally deficient. So we use modern science and, and sometimes testing to make sure people are adequate. And so we're recognizing that a vegan diet or what some people call a plant-based diet, um, I don't know if that means vegan, I'm not sure, the plant-based doesn't really mean that. But as we approach a, a, a diet with less animal products, we reduce exposure to some nutrients, predominantly B12, um, DHA and EPA, which are commonly fish and seafood and small amphibians like reptiles and snakes and frogs. and um, and of course, zinc, you know, zinc could be low. So B12, zinc, and even iodine could be relatively low in some people. So we're making sure, and vitamin D based on sunshine and type of skin tone you have. And so we're just assuring people, sometimes with using supplements, sometimes with using blood tests to make sure they have comprehensive micronutrient adequacy. They're not low in anything that the human body needs that's gonna create an additional problem for them. Lastly, the fourth principle is avoiding toxins, chemicals, parasites, and other dangerous bacteria. In other words, keeping your diet clean, where it's where organic and growing your own food and not eating foods that have chemical or, or, um, 
or metal poisonings. And of course, we've plastic, we've contaminated the oceans with plastic and we get microplastic particles and seafood. But of course, there's plenty of toxic weight, toxic um, materials and some plant matter too, especially the, you know, the GMO and the, you know, the stuff used with Roundup and all the chemicals we put on certain foods. So in any can, the arsenic now and brown rice. So the last principle is keeping your diet as clean as possible. And so we try to put together a, all those factors that could um, affect a person's potential health in the, you know, between the ages of 80 and 100 years old, particularly making sure plant-based eaters don't get two diseases that are at risk for. One is dementia, Parkinson's, due to that is increased risk and shrinkage of the brain with DHA deficiency. And some people don't convert ALA from flax seeds and walnuts into EPA and DHA as readily. And my 30 year experience taking care of elderly vegan communities showed a higher risk of, the, of this problem in healthy vegans living very long time. We don't wanna see them losing their memory and brain shrinkages. And even if they get, you know, with, with most people they'd be dead by the time they're 85 or 90. But with these healthy people, we want them to keep their brain function intact. And the studies show that with an omega-3 index below five, you start to see increased risk of cognitive impairment and brain shrinkage with aging. And so we're trying to achieve with supplementation when necessary, uh, the omega-3 index above five. And the second thing we see in elderly vegans and, and plant-based eaters is a higher risk of hemorrhagic stroke, not ischemic or embolic stroke or heart attack, but hemorrhagic stroke if they're, if they're still eating considerable amounts of salt in their diet. What I'm saying is, you could become more sensitive to the endothelial inflammatory effects of salt. And salt becomes a, how you should say, um, chronically leading to microvascular hemorrhages and irritations in the endothelial lining. Over the years, weakening the blood vessels and without a high degree of atherosclerosis and fat on the body, the fragile blood vessels in the brain aren't coated with fat so they can potentially rupture, especially when there's a combination of high blood pressure and salt consumption. So we want people to not just switch one type of heart um, stroke to another. We also have to be salt conscious. Um, considerably is important to be salt conscious to maintain that, to not have that risk of hemorrhagic stroke. And so speaking of salt, do, would you recommend somebody avoiding salt completely or would a little bit of sea salt or maybe iodized sea salt be okay? I don't think that um, Himalayan salt, Celtic salt, sea salt, I, I, it doesn't matter because it's all the same amount of sodium per teaspoon. It's all 220 milligrams of sodium per teaspoon. There's no better salt than it. That's all bad. All salts are bad. So there's no special salt that makes salt less poisonous. That said, keeping below a thousand is the, the American Heart Association recommends the general, the um, people with heart disease keep their salt intake below 1500 milligrams a day. That's based on studies that show you have decreased death from cardiovascular and stroke death as you go lower than 1500, but it continues to go down as you approach a thousand. Um, so you still so you see benefits when people drop their salt intake to as low as a thousand, you still see continued benefits. So an average diet, let's say without, with just natural foods might give you somewhere between 600 to 700 milligrams of sodium a day. You know, you certainly have a 200 to 300 milligram leeway to add a little coconut aminos or occasional small amounts, but don't forget a quarter teaspoon of conventional of salt still contains like 550 milligrams of sodium. So even a quarter teaspoon could be too much, but they make a lot of things that have salt, um, you know, like that give flavor to foods, you know, Mrs. Dash and there's in, you can use um, coconut aminos or other things that have just maybe a, a hundred milligrams of sodium in them to get a salty flavor. You don't need to douse your things with douse salt on your food and still can keep your salt intake pretty low. There is some, um, a few people like, you know, one in a hundred people who are, who are, who don't hold on to salt well, who need to increase a little more salt in that, but that's particularly rare. And then what about like added minerals that you can add from um, like the little droplets or something that have sodium in them, um, would you just recommend people eating more greens to get their minerals? Or what if they're still low in minerals and they needed to add a little bit of like um, seawater or something to get minerals? There's never a case where that would be um, advocated. I can't even think of a case where that would be helpful. See, when you take an excess salt, your kidney becomes ex expert, develops the ability to excrete a lot of salt. So you're taking a lot, you're pushing a lot out. Your bloodstream has to maintain that steady state. And when you take salt in your diet, you put out salt in your sweat more too. 
When you're on a low salt diet, your kidney develops the ability to hold on to salt, it doesn't release it. And your sweat's not putting out salt when you're exercising and sweating. So your body becomes homeodynamic, dynamically, it keeps the salt intake constant, whether you're on a high level or a low level. But when you're eating more salt, it requires more drinking. You, you, you urinate out more salt, you sweat out more salt. And as salt leaves the body, it takes minerals with it. So then you're losing magnesium and potassium and other electrolytes when you're urinating out the extra salt. So extra sodium makes you lose more minerals. And extra sodium with other minerals just makes you lose more of the sodium and more mineral. Just work, just overworks the body and creates more, and just um, is a factor leading to premature aging. We don't want the body to be flushing minerals in and out like, like that. So, um, there's, and there's not the necessity to replace salt or other minerals with sweating if you, unless you're on a high salt diet, because you're not going to develop them electrolyte imbalances from sweating or exercise when you're not over consuming salt. salt. What are the major contributing factors of aging and how can we slow the process down significantly? Somewhat in these basic principles of nutritarian eating, it encompasses eating a diet high in nutrients. But one of the major factors that people don't recognize is even moderate amounts of fat on the body speed up the rate at which you age. Because if I take in an extra 200 calories a day, it's an, and by the way, it's about 3,500 calories a pound of body fat. So if the 350 days, every extra 100 calories should put about 10 pounds on the body. So an extra 200 calories a day that I don't need would put about 20 pounds of weight on the body at the end of the year, you would think, but it doesn't happen. Because with excess calories you're consuming, the body tries not to put it on as fat and it raises the metabolic rate. So it'll speed up the rate at which it's burning calories as you take in extra calories you don't need. And so only half the calories will come on as fat. So when you consume extra calories your body doesn't need, it increases your respiratory quotient, the amount of calories burned through breathing. It raises your body temperature. It increases your thyroid function. Your body sets into motion a series of biological events that try to burn off the calories, but you expend your stem cell and your telomeres because of that. When you increase the metabolic rate and you burn your furnace at a higher rate because of excess calories, now you're aging at a faster rate. Now, if let's say I undershoot my calories over my metabolic needs by 100 calories a day, just eat a little less or skip dinner once in a while, or eat a lighter dinner or an earlier dinner, and I keep myself slim, and I'm talking about you know, a male should have a BMI below 22 and a female should have a BMI below 21 to have maximal health because fat on the body is pro-inflammatory tissue that spews out free radicals and cytokines and lycokines and make your immune system, interferes with the immune system function, it raises estrogen, increasing risk of breast and prostate cancer. Fat cells are pathologic. We, should, there's no, we shouldn't be having fattened humans. Right. We should be slim humans. We should see our abdominal musculature. Yeah. Nevertheless, what I'm saying right now is as I undershoot calories just a hair, my body's not gonna lose weight because my body through exercise, it's been told to maintain those, that degree of muscular strength and, and bone fitness. So my body will try not to lose weight as I restrict my calories just a bit. And it'll try not to lose weight by lowering the body temperature, by lowering thyroid function, by lowering the calories burned through breathing, the respiratory quotient. And in doing so, you'll slow the aging process you'll stabilize stem, stem cells and maintain telomere length. And you can see people aging backwards. I know that sounds ridiculous, hard to believe, but I could measure telomere length in people and, 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 and explain to them that phytochemical exposure, high phytochemical exposure from a variety of particular vegetables and fruits and seeds, but particularly greens, regular exercise and moderate caloric restriction or eating a little less calories has an effect to raise these longevity proteins like CERT1 and AMP kinase that stabilize stem cells, maintain your telomere length, and other, otherwise per, slow down the aging process. And we could see, let's say if we're doing a telomere length test, we could see a person with who's biologically 50, who's chronologically 50 years old, and we measure their test and it says they have the telomeres of a 60 year old and they're only 50. But then we test them three months later after eating super healthy, and now they have the telomeres of a, of a 60 year old in their 50. So they made them, so no, now they have the telomeres of a 40 year old in their 50. Now they're 10, you know, so we saw them actually age backwards by measuring the blood. And by the way, within the normal range of thyroid function, the normal range of T4, there's half the heart attacks and reduced rate of irregular heartbeat in the bottom half of thyroid function. So this idea that we're trying to raise thyroid, speed up our metabolic rate so we can eat more food and not get fat is totally backwards to the process of longevity. We don't want to speed up our thyroid. We want to keep our thyroid relatively slowed so we're aging slower. 
And if you have hypothyroidism and you need to take thyroid replacement hormone, you should not be taking so much that it pushes you into the higher range of normal. You should let your, you should let your TSH be between two and four and not medicate yourself to a TSH between one and two. You don't over medicate because it can increase your risk at the rate of your age because you're, don't forget your metabolism is the rate at which you're aging your body. And we want a slower metabolism. Contrary to what most people think, we want to be able to eat less food without losing weight. We want to eat as little as possible without getting too thin. We don't want to eat as much as possible without getting fat. People want to increase the metabolic rate so you can eat more food and not get fat. That's right. not the goal. The goal is to be able to eat less and not get thin, not to eat more and not get fat. And we don't desire extra food when we're eating, right? By the way, the, our hypothalamus, the con, apostat control in the hypothalamus feels satisfied when we're eating a diet whole, so high in nutrients and fiber. So we're eating the amount of food we feel like we desire and it also is the amount of food we require. There's no overweight, no obese, you know, primitive humans or squirrels or monkeys or deer running around the woods. Their apostat is well controlled. They know exactly when they eat their natural foods, they eat the right amount of food and they all are not, they're all slim, muscular and are all the right size. Why is exercise the only safe way to raise the metabolism? Exercise doesn't really raise your core metabolism. It raises your peripheral metabolism as a difference. One is raising, so we're not raising our burn rate. We're not increasing our metabolic rate with exercise. We're increasing the caloric utilization in our muscle tissues. And that increased caloric utilization burns more calories. So now I'm, it's a sense of increasing my metabolic rate because I'm burning off those calories and I'm having my body now um, be the equivalent of having consumed less calories because my muscle tissue utilized calories. And once you exercise that muscle, you know, I worked out in the gym or I dug all, been digging ditches or I'm doing exercises or whatever it is, those, once you activate those muscles, they stay metabolically active for the whole week. They still have an increased amount of calories being burned over the next week compared to a muscle that's been rested, been continually rested. So we're saying we do multiple body parts each day. We do might do shoulders and back and one day and abdominal and lower back another day and pulling motions one day and walking up hills another day and running on the beach another day and you know doing hand and stretch another day. Doing, so, we, so by the end of five days, you've covered all these different body parts that each of them individually have their metabolism increased because the body part itself is utilizing more calories because they've been exercised. It's not the same thing as raising the systemic core temperature and, and, and um, thyroid and respiratory quotient, not the same thing as burning more calories and increasing metabolism. It's just utilizing those calories so you can um, to duplicate actually, it actually duplicates having less calories because you're burning it off. So your muscles are eating them up. Oxidative stress is the leading cause of aging. What is it and how do we combat it? Oxidative stress, some people use the term free radicals or reactive oxygen species. When a diabetic becomes, gets diabetic retinopathy or kidney failure, it's because they have a buildup of, of, um, ox of reactive oxygen species and advanced glycation end products, which age tissues more rapidly. You know, we build up more oxidation or oxidative chemicals when we're consuming rancid species like cooked oils and cooked meats and things like that. And, and we eat, you know, bread and white flour. When we eat foods that are, that are, have, that are void of nutrients, the body can't maintain its control of free radicals. Of course, we need a continual exposure to a high amount of antioxidants and phytochemicals. And we're saying there are thousands of phytochemicals in the plant kingdom. And our brain is particularly dependent on a continual exposure to phytochemicals to maintain oxidation in the brain or, or rapid aging of the brain. Muscle tissue can generate its own antioxidant effects, but brain tissue cannot. You need phytochemical exposure and that's where we're talking about, you know, plant variety. In other words, you don't just eat one vegetable, you eat multiple types of vegetables. Even the wheel study, the Women's Healthy Eating and Living study showed that vegetables were the food that showed the most protection against cancer. But they still showed that fruits and vegetables showed more protection than just vegetables alone. And the Seventh-day Adventist Health Study too showed the same thing. Even though vegetables were the most protective, the high protein plant foods like edamame and, you know, and nuts and sunflower seeds and hemp seeds had lifespan promoting effects and adding more nutritional variety 
has more lifespan promoting effects as you widen your food choices, and especially as you get more plant protein in the diet, because as we age, our requirements for plant protein increase a little bit. So the trick here, the magic trick for longevity is reducing animal protein and eating more high protein plant foods, treating your body like an athlete, especially as you eat, age to maintain muscle mass and muscle strength as we age and eating those high protein plant foods like beans, like lentils, like broccoli florets, like sunflower seeds, like hemp seeds, Mediterranean pine nuts. In other words, making sure your plant diet is relatively pro protein rich. What is NRF2 and how does that play a role in combating oxidative stress? That's right. NRF2 is a transcription protein that activates the section of the cell that code for removal of toxins, cell repair, um, keeps, it could keep um, abnormal cell genetic code from being expressed so NRF2 is our master protector. It's the, you know, it's the, um, we're, we're taking our DNA and we're making it work like it's supposed to be working to make us live a long time and protect us from disease. You could say NRF2 is our disease protector and it's activated by these phytochemicals we're talking about, particularly from green cruciferous vegetables is a powerful NRF2 activator. We're talking about the isothiocyanates and green cruciferous like broccoli and kale and bok choy and, you know, and arugula. And I'm a bok choy fanatic because they don't attract pests like aphids and bugs in the garden. Wow. And they grow so beautifully and so easily. And they can, if you can, you can pick them later or pick them earlier, they last in the garden. They don't go, like, if I don't pick the lettuce, it goes to seed and gets bitter so fast. If I put the cabbage out there, it's swarming with the insects a lot of the times. It, you know, so, but you put the bok choy out of the, there and you have this beautiful plant that's clean as a whistle with no insects on it. It, you can pick it a week later or two weeks later, it doesn't matter. You could juice it, you could cook it, you could eat it raw, you could put it in your salad, you can eat it with a dip, it's so versatile. Um, so I'm really just um, loving and enjoying buying different varieties of bok choy seeds actually, and Ooh. planting little bok choy, red bok choy in my garden and, eat, and, and doing less cabbage because the cabbage obviously is harder to keep pest free, you know, mm. to keep full, it's all full of aphids and bugs. I know I just had to pull a bunch of curly kale that I grew in my garden because it was all aphid and buggy. Yeah. It was disappointing. I but guess you could eat the bugs or wash them off in salt water, but it's just so nice to grow bok choy and not have to worry about that. Yes, I'm gonna try that. Thank you for that little tip. What are antioxidants and why are they so important in slowing the aging process? What is the most powerful longevity promoting food there is? Because reactive oxygen species are a buildup of reactive oxygen species have a negative impact. Some reactive oxygen species controlled in the cellular um, organelles help chew up waste, they serve a purpose. But when you have excessive amounts, they can cause havoc and destruction and cause inflammation. Mm. Now, we need a high level of antioxidants to keep the free radicals from escaping from their confines where they're used to be garbage metabolizers like co garbage compactors. So free radicals aren't all bad, we need some of them, but we gotta keep them well contained in, in the right structure in the cell. And antioxidants help us do that. They don't let free radicals escape from their confines. And we can use the term phytochemicals and antioxidants sometimes interchangeably because most phytochemicals work as antioxidants. Some work as stressing the cell and we, we respond back with more cellular vigor, but there's a lot of different mechanisms via which they work. But there are vitamins that are antioxidants and there are phytochemicals that are antioxidants but the same foods rich in, you know, we're saying that the, the high nutrient foods, particularly green vegetables and berries and beans are rich, are very rich in phytochemicals and antioxidants, both. And, one of, and we are a green vegetable dependent animal, just like the other primates. Mm -hmm. Our body does not function normally without a high exposure to green vegetables. You know, I always say, if you don't like green vegetables, you better live close to a hospital. Mm -hmm. Because it's like, you know, women get neural tube defects if they're folate deficient. Well, why would they be folate deficient if they're eating green vegetables? And then doctors come along and give them folic acid pills, which increase the risk of breast cancer, right. instead of telling them to eat green vegetables. We're green vegetable dependent. This is so critical to not rely on folic acid, but to actually eat the vegetables because a diet low in greens during pregnancy and even two years prior to conception is associated with an increased risk of childhood cancers in the offspring. And even brain tumors are affected by um, luncheon meats, processed meats, and the lack of green vegetables in the diet. So what I'm saying is 
not only it's not only the diet your child eats, it's the diet your mother eats. And not only the mother eats during the pregnancy, even the diet she eats before she gets pregnant affects the health of her offspring. And what I'm saying right now is green vegetables are so critical in the diet and all of us, because we can't expect normalcy for a human primate unless you consume a consumer of green vegetables. And would you say the most powerful longevity promoting food there is, is, is part of, is the like broccoli, cauliflower, the brassica family? Yes, that's correct. But the green brassica family, not cauliflower as much as bok choy and arugula and watercress and kale oh. and collard greens and mustard greens and turnip greens are more, are even more nutritionally rich than cauliflower, which is still a good food. What is acrylamide and why should we avoid it? Also, what are ages and how do the two relate? That's right. Ages stand for A-G-E. And A-G-E's at age us, they stand for advanced glycation end products. As we're exposed to more glycemic carbohydrate, especially cooked carbohydrate and darkened and burnt carbohydrates, we get more glucose in the bloodstream, which then, and the acrylamides, which are the, you know, burnt part of breads or the crispy part of a pizza crust or a pretzel or a bagel, or the, and you form acrylamides in animal products and, and plant foods when they're overly cooked or baked. Most of our cooking is like water-based cooking, walking, blanching, steaming, you know, cooking in a stew, or, you know, we're not trying to like um, darken, blacken, or make things crispy because you increase acrylamide formation and acrylamide formation increases AGEs buildup in the body too, over just regular consuming glucose. And some people, scientists consider them a mild carcinogen because they have some mild carcinogenic effects, but mostly it's just, they, they do promote aging and we're trying, you don't want to burn toast or make your toast brown. You know, we're trying to undercook our food and mostly cook with water-based cooking methods to prevent the formation of acrylamides and excessive AGEs in the body. So AGEs age us. And when the diabetic becomes, you know, blind with diabetic retinopathy or macular degeneration, and then it's because the buildup of AGEs in the reactive oxygen species that are primarily responsible but of course we accelerate aging with excess animal protein because then you build up uric acid, urea, and ammonia too, which is which also are very toxic in the body. All the extra protein is turned into toxic waste. We don't, we can store the extra fat as fat, but the extra protein, the body turns into, you know, acids and toxic waste products and other toxins that are affect brain function. So, and so it's, it's almost like this combination of processed foods and high glycemic carbohydrates with animal products, particularly animal products that are cooked with barbecue and grilled and fried and flame broiled. And that combination is particularly deadly, you know? And it's almost as if I say that like, the American diet has been designed by ISIS, you know, or by scientists to kill people because the worst things you could possibly do to accelerate aging and cause cancer, that's what Americans do, the very worst. We combine the worst plant material, which is cooked and baked and crispy and crusty and, you know, chips and pretzels with these overly cooked animal products. And we put them both together in a diet. It's just, it's just almost disgusting. So you would, so I, Dr. Furman, I love air fries. Would you say that air fries are probably not the best? Are there, are, are there going to be, um, is there acrylamide formation in air fries? If they get a little bit probably if, if you brown to the degree that they're, they're browned they're probably do they get a little brown and crispy when you air when you put them in the air fryer yeah so you probably you're getting a little bit of acrylamide formation i'm not saying the body can't tolerate it a little bit a couple times a week or have something a little brown but i don't think it should be the regular source of your vegetable intake to do it that way just and even like a baked potato too would probably be the best you right, it's probably better than, because even when you bake the sweet potato in the oven, a lot of chefs and people like to bake it so long, so it's like pouring like the um, sticky, you know, sugar is pouring out of it and it maximizes the sweetness. That's probably not the best for your health. It's probably better to boil it in water a long time and get it soft so it's not caramelizing and forming sugar. It's still sweet, but you didn't caramelize it. So it's probably better, you know, um, to make things in a soup or a stew cooking potatoes or sweet potato in a stew with a water base is probably healthier than baking it in the oven until it's really, because you've got to cook a potato a long time to get it to be soft in the oven too. We should talk about your book for a second. So all of my questions are from your new book, Eat for Life, and it's also on Audible and that's how I listen to it. Um, so I, I will put a link for this. 
And in, in this book, you speak about how coffee has acrylamide as well. And now America is very addicted to coffee because we're not getting a lot of sleep. And then we go to coffee, we're, we go to the caffeine beverages, but there is a, a high amount of acrylamides in coffee. Is that correct? Yes, anything that's roasted and darkened or blackened is exposing you to more acrylamides. That's why green tea is better than like even black tea. And that's why herbal teas, but they're not roasted. But keep in mind, a lot of people don't know that eating a hot steaming beverage can irritate the tongue and the, and the throat passageways, increasing your risk of tongue and throat cancer from the chronic exposure to the hot beverage just being hot. Even if it was just plain water being hot, it would, could expose you to heightened levels of tongue and throat cancer. Eating even soups that are burning hot, they continually micro burns to your tongue and your throat from eating excessively hot beverages. So I'm saying right now, if you like to have a tea or an herbal tea or a green tea, you shouldn't have it seeping hot, steaming, where it's almost burning your mouth. You should wait till it cools down or drop an ice cube in or don't heat it that hot. Make it warm, not so hot. So what I'm saying is it's, a, it's a still a risk factor. So people should be concerned about that, of over eating overly hot substances. We're getting such golden nuggets in this interview. Thank you so much. Can you explain what mitochondria are and how to prevent mitochondrial decay? It gets back to this interesting phenomenon, contrary to way people thinking. There's not one best diet that reverses heart disease and another diet that's great for dementia, the dementia diet, another diet that's better for breast cancer and another diet that's better for you know pancreatic cancer, another diet that's better for, you know, it's the same dietary portfolio that exposes you to the right amount of all these nutrients and the right amount may, may not be excessive amounts. You could take too much vitamin D or too much vitamin K or too much of uh, vitamin E. You, know, you could wanna be in the right range of, of, of excellence, which is usually deficient is not bad and excess is not bad. You wanna be in a sweet spot, for example. And so you're, and the same thing is true with what's the diet for your kidney? What's the right diet for your liver? What's the right diet for your mitochondria or your endoplasmic reticulum or your nucleus of your cell, your DNA? There's no such thing. It's what I'm saying to you is that um, the right foods seem to allow our body to age more slowly and protect all our organelles, all cellular surfaces and all organs and protect against this, all the diseases simultaneously. So if you're gonna be on a vegan diet and get yourself so your omega-3 index is one or two so low, it might have an effect on shrinking brain, but it'll reduce immune system function as well. It'll be, it'll be more irritating to your heart as well. It's not gonna only affect brain function that your omega-3 index. If your B12 is so low, it's not just gonna make your brain age faster. It's gonna make you, it's gonna raise homocysteine, which is gonna inflame the interior walls of your arteries and your legs or your, and your, hurt your nerves. So what I'm saying is that, that optimizing your nutrient intake is better for all parts of the body and protective against all diseases. So can you help explain what and, mitochondria is or what they are? Yeah, you know, and, and people also talk about the microbiome, don't forget that. Mm -hmm. They say, oh, it's all about the microbiome, all about the bacteria in your gut. Mitochondria are the powerhouse of the cell where energy is made in the cell. And, it, it, and, and it's uh, because it functions and it's always being worked, it can age itself and be and have to be replaced. And that's okay, the body has the ability to replace cells that are aging and organelles that are aging. And we're saying with the right diet, the cell and the cell structure ages slowly. If it has to be replaced, your stem cells are activated. When cells become abnormal surfaces or, or they can be removed before they can become cancerous, the body has built-in checks and balances mm -hmm. that prevent anything, that prevents things from happening to us. We're a miraculous self-healing and self-repairing machine, but these, self miraculous self healing mechanisms are only activated with a high exposure to vegetables and onions and what they're talking about these four foods that have the best effect on activating the you could say the mitochondria protective mechanisms and giving you micro diversity of the microbiome simultaneously and it's, there's two cooked foods in particular cooked mushrooms and cooked um, beans, cooked beans and cooked mushrooms. You have to cook beans very well. Beans should be soft, not, not you know, hard like, a, like you make broccoli al dente, that's great, but don't, you gotta cook beans a long time to get maximum nutrition effects. 
And we shouldn't be eating much raw mushrooms because they have a mild carcinogen called agarotene in most mushrooms. And there's still you know, other substances that are better off cooked and you retain these longevity effects with cooked mushrooms. And the two raw foods are obviously you know, the, the raw scallion or onion, very important for optimal health. And the second food, of course, is the green leafy vegetables, lettuce, kale, bok choy, cabbages, arugula, watercress, you can eat raw on your salad. And those are so incredibly lifespan promoting and beneficial to the, or to the mitochondria and the microbiome, particularly when you liquefy them in your mouth and you chew them really well. Because they liberate, they form the, these beneficial antioxidants and they form these isothiocyanides with their most protective effects to activate the NRF2 transcription proteins. They get their most protection when, the, when these beneficial nutrients are formed in the mouth. Because as the cell walls are crushed, the enzymes activate the formation of these beneficial compounds. If you don't chew very well and you kind of like swallow things halfway, you're gonna form not even one tenth the amount as you could concentrate on chewing. I'm saying be mindful when you eat your salad. My mantra is to eat at least one nice big salad a day. And then when you eat it, chew it super well to try to liquefy every mouthful in your mouth to get the full benefits out of it. And then the dressing you put on it that has some nuts and seeds in there facilitates the absorption of those anti-cancer phytochemicals that makes it so protective. And the more and people say, well, can't you put it in a blender to break down the vegetables and eat a green smoothie? Sure you could. But when you chew it, you get added benefits. It adds benefits to your jaw, your teeth, you mix with bacteria in the mouth, you form more nitric oxide. There's all kind of additional benefits from chewing a salad real well, including muscle strengthening and muscular endurance. So what I'm saying, eat the greens and chew them really well and, and eat raw greens every day and some cooked greens, but have that salad at least once a day. In our last interview, I remember, and this stuck with me, and I try to implement this in my life as well, and I've been seeing incredible benefits. Um, so a pound of leafy greens, or a pound of raw vegetables, I should say, and a pound of cooked vegetables per day. Yeah, some guideline. They say, well, how much should I eat? And I'm not fixated on getting a pound. And if you're a small person, that's too much for you, then don't have that much. Yeah. But it's but a pound is, is like one tomato could weigh three quarters of a town. One tomato and one carrot could almost be a pound. One head of romaine lettuce could almost be a half of eight ounces. And one head of romaine lettuce and a tomato and some extra car raw carrots or raw beets or raw jicama or raw snow pea pods or raw could be, a, it's not that much food is a pound of food is not that much, you know? Sure. And then cooked vegetables. Well, think about it, you know, you know, like one eight ounce bag of Frozen broccoli Florence is half a pound. My four-year-old daughter would eat that in nursery school. You know yeah. what I mean? So it's not, vegetables is not, a, you know, two, that's one eight ounce serving, at least two servings of vegetables between cooked in your soup at lunch or in your, you know, your ditch. It doesn't, it's not that much food, even though it sounds like a lot of food, a pound a pound. Yes. Most people, it's approximately the right amount of food, but some people may need a little more, some people may need a little, little less, yeah. you know? I just don't want people to get fixated too much on the exactness of the precise amount. We shouldn't eat till, our full, till we're full. We should eat till we're satisfied, not full. And we should chew really well. And we shouldn't wake from the table, go up from the table with our stomach stretched out. We shouldn't be trying to force the food into us. You know what I mean? To just get all those nutrients in. Just eat what's comfortable and be hungry for the next meal. Err on the side of under eating just a hair. Don't err on the side of overeating. What daily amount of EPA and DHA should one be consuming for optimal health? What are the risks of too much and too little? And do adult men and women need different amounts than children? The Nutritional Research Foundation supported a study done by researchers where they followed the DHA omega and EAP omega-3 index on about 150 um, long-term vegans. And they found that about 60% had levels below four but there were 20% with levels above five, which was adequate. So that meant that these were non-supplementing vegans. And of course, like 20, 30% had super low levels, almost non-existent levels, but just between zero and 2.5, putting them at heightened, really heightened danger of depression or, or dementia. So there was so there's a, a large, so for most people, we give people between, let's say 200 and 300 milligrams of EPA DHA like I have a, like a dropper where people have taken in a, a vegan sourced plant-based EPA and DHA. And most people, including myself, take about, two, take about 250 to 300 a day, one dropper full a day. Okay, okay. But that doesn't mean that, 
as we age, it might be appropriate, and I'd have to do it on myself, to check your omega-3 index and see based on your diet and your genetics, is that amount you're taking the right amount? Is your omega-3 index above five where it should be or is it still a little low? In most cases, we found out that that amount was enough to push the vast majority of people into the normal range. So I think that's a good amount between 200 and 300 milligrams a day. Okay. Most people. But there are some people who adequate levels with none, you know what I mean? And some people that probably need, need more too. What tests are there specifically to, if somebody wants to get tested and see if they're- The, the best test is called omega-3 index, because it's very easy to remember. It tells the percent of omega of DHA and EPA compared to omega-6 on the cell membranes. And as you gain weight and get f overweight, your omega-6 goes up in your tissues and your omega-3 index goes down. So losing weight helps you restore the level back to normal as you su and supplementing too. Okay. So it's something of a strong concern of mine because as a physician in, in primary care, taking care of elderly vegan communities, I saw all my, and by the way, all my mentors, I got into this originally through the natural hygiene movement because my father was sickly and read books by Herbert Shelton of the natural hygiene fame and eating more natural foods and getting, and, and all these mentors and people I used to hear lecturing on the advantages of eating fruits and vegetables and things like that, and who lived that lifestyle. They lived a relatively long time, but a lot of them became demented and developed Parkinson's. Almost all of the people I respected developed some neurologic disorders after they aged. And it made me more concerned about what's going on here. They didn't have heart attacks, they didn't get cancer. They developed some brain issue. So I started checking blood on everybody for omega-3 index, finding a lot of elderly vegans with very, very low levels. And particularly those elderly vegans who developed Parkinson's had super low levels. And there's some indication in the scientific literature, particularly with animal studies, that very low levels of DHA and EPA can make your brain more sensitized and more vulnerable to the toxins that can cause Parkinson's disease. Mm -hmm. So my, I was alarmed because like Dr. Shelton and Kiki Sidwa and all these doctors who I knew were super healthy developed Parkinson's disease on vegan diets, you know? What is anxiolytic depression and how can it be treated and prevented? Well, you know, there's, dep people are, are obviously get depression. And so anxiolytic depression is that mixture of anxiety with depression, it's so very common. And there's a lot of causes and they're not all just causes of dementia, for example. We're talking about low DHA being a cause of dementia, but the average American gets dementia not from low DHA, they get dementia from lack of phytochemicals and lack of vegetables in the diet and from atherosclerosis related dementia. You know, and so we're talking about just the plant-based vegan risk of low DHA, but everybody else is at high risk anyway, even, even when they eat a lot of fish and EPA and DHA. Right. Most people don't get them from DHA deficiency. It's the same thing as here with, with, um, with depression. There's a lot of potential causes, toxicity, genetics. It's usually a poor converter of, you know, they're usually low in DHA, but they also have serotonin issues. There's a lot of issues that could biologically predispose a person. One thing we know that the consumption of refined carbohydrates, fast food, and commercial baked goods like bread and pretzels and cookies and bagels, double the, double the lifetime risk of depression with just two servings a day, uh, excuse me, two servings a week. Two servings a week of bagels, cookies, or commercial baked goods or French fries or pizza doubles your risk of developing depression. And it goes up from there in a dose dependent manner. The brain is dependent on not just fatty acids, but phytochemicals and antioxidants and the right kind of amino acids and things. So, so often, so often um, depression and anxiolytic depression is related to some kind of nutritional imbalances. And, and, even, and even toxicity. And the practitioner sometimes has to work with these people to ascertain what is it is missing here? What is not ideal here? And we, so we have to get the diet perfect. And then of course, sometimes using some extra supplements in this case can be helpful There's some natural things that help better. It's better to use natural substances in this case than using drugs like serotonin uptake inhibitors because the drugs become very addicting because a person, it makes you dependent on the medications for the rest of your life once you start using them regularly. So it's better not to be on them long-term and to switch to something more natural and deal with the cause of depression as much as you can. And there's a lot of great information out there and great books on the psych, on the way to think and the, you know, to have the right mindset to help dealing with these things that also helps the pattern of behaviors and the thought processes that are also help, you know, there's over one book is called um, 
not overcoming happiness. Um, I think I forgot the name of this book. But in any case, there's, there's some great books out there that are very helpful to the, the, this too. But, but nutritionally is a big element in almost every disease to help people make recoveries. If you think about it, send it to me and I'll put it in the link um, for, this, for this episode. I find it very fascinating that food is so imbalanced in the standard American diet. Like it's refined. It's, it's literally out of balance. It's not balanced. But food that grows out of the earth the way God made it for us is so perfectly balanced balanced and then when we eat balanced food our bodies get balanced and get healthy i mean it's really quite a beautiful process and really so simple and then we just complicate it but we need to simplify it again and um and then it restores balance and it's it's, it's truly no. all balance i'm hearing that a lot you know from our conversation yeah what you're doing is you're reflecting the beauty of nature yeah. and the gratitude we have for the wonder of natural foods and what they contain in them. Yeah. And so people say, oh, shoot me right now. I'd rather be dead if I had to eat that way. And I can't, you know, just, but the, but the truth is we learn how to make our taste buds adapt. We learn delicious recipes. And when we eat this way, we're more at peace. Yes. We're at peace and confidence. We're not fearful of diseases, more respectful of the body's um, miraculous self-healing powers and the wonder of these natural foods, which we appreciate and are grateful for. And we make enjoy them more because intellectually and emotionally, we're thankful and appreciative of the wonder of what of these beautiful foods we're able to eat. Yeah. And we have this opportunity where we can have the access to all these healthy foods and take advantage of this opportunity to live to be 95 or 100 years old with a full mental faculties and have a great life, which ancestors and other people didn't, didn't, have, this, didn't have this opportunity to do so. Even the blue zones, are not ideal diets. They're just better than American diets. They're not scientifically designed to maximize nutritional exposure and prevent, you know, they they're just happen to be living about eight years longer compared to Americans, but why not live 20 years longer? We can take the blue zones and do much better than the blue zones using science and to, to devise the diet better. And we can make it even taste better too. And so I find most of the overweight food addicted people that come to my retreat and stay with me a few months, and sometimes they're here, they don't wanna be here. They're like relatives put them here or they're you know, whatever, but they're angered and they're more um, how she, agitated yeah. and complaining and they're, they're more dysthymic. Their food has created this sense of um, their, uh, the unhappy life and unhappy way of thinking and seeing. And when they get healthier, uh, two months later, they become different personalities. Yeah. They start appreciate they start looking for things to like, not looking for things to complain about. They start, you know, appreciating the world around them. They start relating to other people better. They feel confident in their own existence. They, their brain, they, they lose the brain fog. They become more creative and they become, start to be more compassionate. What I'm saying now is that we're teaching people to be more compassionate, to be more mindful, to try to have goodwill for others as a means of, because you need that to be able to have your self-esteem be high. So you're not depending on other people's approval which you're not gonna get when you're eating differently than them. We want people to be able to sustain this way of living. So we're trying to teach them the right social and emotional um, exercises to help them feel good about themselves and what they're doing. And one thing we're talking about here too is that, um, is, is that this is a, a blessing to be able to get exposure to wonderful foods and enjoy them. And not, it's not, and being, eating an American diet and being a food addict, that's being in prison. That's being imprisoned because you can't be the full person you could have been. You don't have the full humanity, the full intellect, the full creativity. You're not that person you could have been if you had been, if you had been much healthier and you didn't let the food addictions take over your brain and take over part of your life away from you. Why is grilling meat dangerous to one's health? What are polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons, PAHs? And I personally do not even want to be around barbecues where people are grilling meat because you can inhale them. And there was a study that said it can, you can absorb it through your skin too. Even if you, you obviously have clothes on, you can still absorb it through your skin. So why yeah. is it so dangerous to be around? The first cancers that were noted in the scientific literature were scrotal cancers and chimney sweeps from the polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons formed from smoke. And you know how people, all wealthy people put fireplaces in their house and heated their house with wood, burning wood, putting smoke into their house. But, but smoke and inhaling, and that's why people who work in fast food restaurants 
with the, with the rancidity of cooked oils and fried foods and barbecues, that's right, inhaling those foods still increases your risk of cancer even when you're not even eating the food. Yeah. But, you're, but when, when you barbecue or flame broil or fry or darken or when you cook foods into the way people like their meat with it's like dark and crispy on the outside and red on the inside, they got to get it very hot under a flame, under a barbecue, so the outside gets burned fast enough so the inside doesn't get overly cooked. And in doing so, you're creating these um, hydrocyclic amines and these polyaromagic hydrocarbons. You're, you're, you're creating powerful carcinogens that create cancer. So people love to eat cancer-causing foods. Wait, Dr. Furman, so one of my favorite, I think it's like my favorite smell in the entire world is burning wood. Now is burning wood not good for you? Just like, because- Correct. Wait, so it's just as unhealthy for you as burning meat? Well, you're not eating the burning wood, you're just inhaling it usually. So it's not as unhealthy as the meat because they're usually eating the meat and inhaling it. But yes, burning wood is a risk factor for cancer. And here's the thing, dementia can be caused by toxins in the brain too. And with climate change and all these wildfires and pollution due to burning, we're increasing the population's risk of cancer and dementia by exposure to the pollution. More reason to eat right to get the toxins out of your body but more reasons to deal with climate change and to realize that having our forests burned down and our houses burned down and being around smoke all the time is not good for our health. We have to try to reduce that exposure and we've got to you know, work cooperatively with the rest of the world to solve the climate problem with the use of, you know, whether we're using petroleum or excessive travel or using eating meat and, and whatever we're doing wrong, we've got to make a radical change to try to save the planet because we have about 150 million people who are moderately malnourished due to calorie deprivation. And as the climate change gets worse, we're gonna put more millions of people into starvation, malnutrition, more exposure to smoke, floods. You know, it's, it's just, um, it's very, um, you could say, touching that we, it's very important that we work cooperatively, but unfortunately there's so much social norms that prevent nations and people from working cooperatively. So much competition and superiority and, and it's just, we have some religious, um, you know, fervor of this religion be better than that religion and belief systems that are interfering with, the, with humans being able to take care of themselves and the earth and the planet simultaneously, which has to be a, a very critical factor in everybody's thinking nowadays with what's happening to our planet. Can we prevent and repair skin damage caused by UV light by eating certain foods? Can we have, per se, an internal SPF? Yes, absolutely. When you eat a healthy diet, your skin is naturally orange and has more resistance to skin cancer. Um, but keep in mind that it takes about three to five months of eating the right foods. You can't just eat right in on June for your summer trips to the beach. You've got to eat a high green and high phytochemical diet your whole year to get your skin with such a high phytochemical me um, measurements. We measure the phytochemical exposure with a skin carotenoid score machine. And it shows that people take like four to six months to get their level up to safe ranges of eating right. You know, and, and some people with autoimmune conditions or cancers, we give them vegetable juices at, to bring their levels up quicker. You know? But also keep in mind that grapefruit, eating too much grapefruit can sensitize the skin and make you at higher risk of skin cancer and even melanoma. So we don't wanna, if you wanna eat grapefruit, do it in the winter time when you're not outdoors, but don't eat grapefruit when you're getting a lot of, when you're getting sun, cause it can further damage the skin. Interesting, okay, good to know. Age the skin and increase risk of cancer. Okay, and are there any specific foods that we should eat in the summertime to help? Like we shouldn't eat grapefruit, but what should we eat more of? Green, you know, berries, which have a lot of surface area and polyphenols and eating kumquats like Mayway kumquats, which have a lot of lemon in the skin is a better source of for your skin. But I'm not saying to eat in the summertime, I'm saying to eat it all year. But I am saying not to eat grapefruits relatively close to the period where you're getting sun exposure like the summer, because they do um, sensitize the skin for about, a, you know, for a few weeks after eating it. Thank you so much for tuning in. Love Gianna and- Dr. Furman. Thank you.